So pretty much starting anything to make successful, become successful, like owning a business, you have to have a certain mindset. So tell me, and I want you to pretty much go into details of what type of mindset you need to have when starting a business. Because anybody just want to start something, if you don't have the right mindset, it's not going to last. So what type of mindset do you have to start this business? Well, the type of mindset you gotta, you have to have is, the first thing you have to have is a purpose. Why, why you're opening up a business, why you're starting a business. And then that purpose, it's extremely important to let that purpose be something that's been with you for a while, instead of it being something new. New things kind of have a tendency to pass, but if it's something that's been with you for a while, like for me, when I started out, um, I, I grew up helping people. So I always wanted a way to uh, be able to make a living and to be able to make a profit while helping people at the same time. And then I was a single parent and being a single parent, I wanted to have that flexibility to be able to go and pick up my daughter, which made this, this field here look like absolute perfect field for me. It allowed me to help people without charging them for the help. I charge them for a haircut, but yet I give them advice. And then at the same time, it also afforded me that freedom and flexibility to be able to run out, volunteer at my daughter's school, as well as be able to take her to the doctor's appointments and things like that without getting docked at work for leaving work if, if something got serious. And that's pretty much why I wanted to start my business as well. And you're going to get a lot of people that watch the video and they may think it may cause nothing to open a barbershop or to be successful, but you need funds. How do you suggest someone starting out build their funds up so they can run a successful barbershop? The best way to run a successful barbershop or a business at all would be to work in the field at a business that's already established. That way you can get an idea of what it actually takes. You can see it firsthand and get kind of, kind of like a test run. That's why you have a lot of uh, professions that do apprenticeships. And apprentice, even to become a doctor, you have to do your internship, externship, mm -hmm. and you have to do those things so you can get in the field, become affiliated with what's going on in the field, yeah. and then get a better sense of how to do the job mm -hmm. to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one thing to starting off a successful business. Put together your game plan, your strategy, figure out exactly how it is that you want your business to, to be set up. Mm -hmm. Then do your research to find out, okay, how much does it cost to set that business up, and then go ahead and start uh, putting away your funds. Go ahead and start putting away your funds to be able to make your dream come true. A lot of times you can start off with a um, You can start off with a vision that's really big and then as you start looking into that vision more in depthly by working in the field You're like, okay, well this I don't need that. You can start your process of elimination and probably cut your budget in half from what you originally thought you may would have needed to be able to start your business building uh, credit. Credit is a good thing to have to be able to start your business. It gives you some flexibilities. I can't go into all the details about how much flexibility you have, but you have a lot more flexibility when you're using credit than you do when you're just using downright cash to be able to open up your business. Okay, so you suggest go out and get a loan? I don't for, get uh, Me personally, I'm not a loan. I, I, I don't do loans. Okay. I'm not fond of loans. Yes. But I don't knock loans if that's your way. Because everybody that has loans is not necessarily going into debt. You can have the money in the bank, but choose to borrow the money in order to build credit. But if you don't have the money in the bank and you go borrow money, now you're, you're stressing about making sure you have the loan payment. And then on top of it, 10 times out of 10, if you're on your own business, then you're gonna be living out of those funds as well. So now you have to live off those funds and pay them back at the same time. And that can be a little bit overwhelming when you're trying to be an entrepreneur and start out your own business. Okay, so you, what type of loan do you suggest going to a bank or like a credit card? So it depends on- Well, a loan is a loan, regardless of where it comes from. You know, the most important thing when you get in a loan is interest rate. Okay. You know, how, how much am I paying in interest as a result of, of this loan? So you want to go wherever you get the best interest rate. You know, if you got a 0% credit card that gives you a 0% for X amount of months, then why not use your credit card if you're going to pay the money back? If you got a low interest loan at a bank that says, okay, we're going to charge you 2% or 
three percent, then why not go get that loan at the bank? So it all is based on what your percentage rate is, and what's going to be the most effective way for you to be able to borrow the money, pay it back, build your credit, and sustain your business. Okay, so starting out, do you suggest the very you you all you said? First, you suggest working inside of a business. Mm -hmm. So the very next step is build the capital to open the business? No, the, the okay. very next step of, after working inside of a business would be to do your research. Okay. You come up with your game plan and your strategy. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you should always save. Saving should be a part of life. So building capital is something that you're doing from day one. The minute you get an opportunity to save, begin saving, period. And that goes for hard times or future business ventures. That's what, uh, like mortgages, for instance, when you buy a house. That, that, that equity in that house that you're paying for, eventually one day can be the capital to start a business. So at the same time, what you want to do in your, in your profession is, Zay, have a seat right here for a second. The, the, the thing you want to do in your profession is you want to put together your game plan and your strategy, and then you want to itemize that strategy to make sure that you have the... Um, a, a realistic idea of what it's going to cost. So that requires you asking a lot of questions from people who are doing what you want to do and as well as you going in and calling a lot of vendors to find out, okay, what is this vendor charging and what is that vendor charging for the resources that's going to be needed in order to make your business successful. Okay, so before you get a shot and all of that stuff buy equipment and all that you need an LLC is that the very next step to opening up the shop your yeah, LLC you can formulate whenever you choose to you can formulate it before you even decide just know that there's an annual fee for your LLC depending on what state you live in there's an annual fee in the state of Florida we have an annual fee of $150 to renew your LLCs um, and it's about it's probably 70 bucks to start your LLC if you do it yourself but if you go in and do it yourself, then you take the risk of not knowing a lot of the pertinent information that you need to know in order to make sure you manage your books successfully, make sure you keep accurate records for both the federal and the state governments. Um, so the best thing to do would be to seek legal counsel, uh, maybe prepaid legal or something like that may be the cheapest way to go, getting one of those, uh, you know, a, a prepaid legal plan. So when you go in to get your contract done, they can help you with the basics. Um, but for the most part, your LLC, you can formulate whenever you want to before starting the business. You don't necessarily have to. You can formulate it a year before and absolutely do nothing but the minimum. And you can use that as a way of putting your capital into that LLC to start saving. Yes. Or you can take the LLC and you can start it just before you open and take a lump sum of capital, put it in the LLC, and then move forward. It's all The best thing to do is to seek an attorney and a CPA to get what they say are the best ways for you to be able to protect yourself from a tax perspective and from a maintaining the stand within the state and the federal guidelines according to how you should manage your LLC. Okay, thank you. And I'm pretty much doing this as a standpoint of someone who's already a barber. And I just want to put in a little segment of... I'm actually a cosmetologist that... Owns a barbershop. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so, for those of who has no license or anything, and they this is something they're interested in, how do you suggest they go about getting their license? Let me tell you what I did. Okay. What I did was I went to school first, yeah. and I made rules within myself that I would not, under any circumstances, cut hair outside of school, or cut hair in the house until I had a license. And the reason why I did that was to ensure that I didn't get caught up cutting hair in the kitchen and never got a license. So it would put me in a position to focus on the license and getting established and learning about the business opposed to making the money. A lot of times when we get into business, the first thing we want, first thing we want to do is we want to make money. And most business people will tell you, if you focus on the money, the business more than likely will fail. But if you focus on the foundations and the principles of your business, then the business will more than likely succeed. Money doesn't keep businesses open. It can keep a business open, but that money will be outgoing money. It won't be capital that you're holding in your pockets. So what you want to do is you want to ensure that the principles of your business, the foundation of your business, the goals and the purpose of your business are your top priority. So what would you say your next step is? after getting your license, doing the research, building up the capital that you need to open a barbershop and getting all the knowledge 
from working up under right. someone who owns a shop. Well, next thing you do, you go out and find a location. Location, 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 location. And you don't want to find, a, I always suggest finding a location on a main street with easy access. You don't want to find one on a street with too much traffic because too much traffic means that everybody's trying to stay focused on not getting hit or not getting into a wreck opposed to paying attention to the sign that they're passing by that says whatever business, barbershop, salon, or whatever the case may be. So finding the business in the right location, uh, finding the right location for your business is a big deal. Big, 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 big deal. Okay, and you don't want to go, for those uh, who thinking they have to go and find a three and four thousand dollar a month properties, what do you think the ideal rent should be when you just starting out? It varies. It varies from one, one side of town to the next. Um, the ideal rent for you would be based on your budget. Um, you know, you got a guy that's coming in with a thousand dollars. His ideal rent wouldn't be twelve hundred dollars a month. You know, the ideal rent for him would be finding something where he maybe ha may have to pay anywhere from uh, seventy-five dollars a week at, at a booth rental and a barbershop. Because when you when you rent a booth in a barbershop, that's the equivalent of having your own business. You can still have your own LLC and all of that because you're paying a monthly rent for that booth. So you're an independent business. Um, in, in a building amongst other business. You just don't have that privacy that you would have by having your own particular barbershop or salon. And it's much cheaper than going in and starting. It's much cheaper. It's much cheaper. It's much cheaper and much more beneficiary. You get used to working in that group environment. You get to listen and get a feel for different types of clients' personalities. Um, you get to learn your do's and your don'ts, your definite do's and your definite don'ts, because sometimes we open a business and think that some things are okay, and then once you get it going, and you realize that, well, I, I shouldn't have done this, but now I'm too deep in, I'm five years in, and these people are, are accustomed to this, and now in order for me to change this rule, I'm, I'm going to have to lose my whole clientele, okay. which, which is something that I did and when I first started out. And that's something you should avoid. So. Yeah, you should avoid doing that. Like when I first started out, I was a big one the you know, gluing hair in people's head and doing the ponytails and all that kind of stuff. But then one day, you know, five years down the line, I'm looking at my client's hair going, this is not what I want to do. You know, I want, I, want, I want people to have healthy hair. I don't want people not to have edges and all this kind of stuff. So I just blatantly stopped, and as a result, it was a start over. So all those clients are gone. They're not going to sit down and help you chase your passion. They came to you because you supported what it was that they did. Now, as a result of you not supporting what they do anymore, maybe one or two will stay, but the majority of them are going to go find someone to continue to give them that product. So you have to make sure that you're, de you're delivering the product that you want to deliver. And that's something that you should make sure you find out during your research, research phase, which is the, where the benefits of being a booth runner in a barbershop comes from. Yeah. And let's say someone has the funds and they did all the research, they worked up under someone and they found their location. Should they start out as a barbershop only or should they implement the hair salon as well? Well, you, should, you shouldn't do things that you have no experience with. Okay. If you have no experience with dealing with a salon, then you probably shouldn't open one up. And if you do open one up, you should open one up with someone who has the experience of running a salon, someone who's actually um, ran a successful salon or been in a successful environment and doesn't necessarily mind. You know, one of the difficult, difficult things in today's world is that everybody's looking to be their own boss. Everybody's looking to be independent. So it's kind of hard to find those people who really have that skill set to come in and help you get, get it off the ground. So if you're a special, if you specialize in something, then stick to your specialty. And then as time progresses and your, your time starts to free up as you move forward and you grow, then you start to expand yourself. But the, the diverse portfolio concept doesn't come from you jumping into six things at a time. It comes from you perfecting one thing at a time and gradually adding things over, over, over time. Okay. okay, so now we found the shop, found the good location. The rent is in our price range. Now it's time to fill the shop up. Would you say fill the shop up with the equipment? That's the very next step. To fill it up with the equipment? Well, yes. Well, the first thing to do is, is, is to go to your state uh, laws and regulations to figure out what exactly what it is that you're supposed to have in, in your salon. All your safety data sheets, um, the, the plumbing, make sure your plumbing, plumbing is adequate, the number of sinks and chairs that you have in the shop are inconsistent, are consistent with your state 
and local laws. Those are the things that, that are most important. Learn what your, what your state and your local laws are when it comes down to operating a salon within that vicinity or in that area are like your top priorities. And say, for instance, we're in Florida. Where would we find this information? Uh, you can go to, in the state of Florida, yes. Department of Professional Business Regulation. They regulate all business in the state of Florida. So you go to their website or you can call the DPBR and the DPBR will give you, uh, direct you to the resources that are necessary in order for you to open up a shop. And then the, um, the inspectors will come by and inspect the shop before you open it, all that kind of good stuff. And then locally, they'll tell you exactly what you need. And sometimes locally, all you need to do is just make sure you have um, the, the, the fire safety things in place. You know, your fire extinguishers, your, um, if you have the, um, the internal fire, the sprinkler system, if that's required in your, with, with your local government, those are the things that you would find out from them. So you go to your city, your, your city hall or your um, city building, whatever, wherever it's located in your city, and you go to them. And then if you're also regulated by a county entity, then you would go to that county building clerk's office or whatever the case may be to figure out exactly what it is that's needed in order for you to get going. Okay, so, and once you have all that information, then you can go as far as purchasing the equipment? Yeah, then you can begin to pur purchase your equipment. Okay. And yeah. the equipment is going to be based on the services that you offer. If you don't want to go out and buy um, a massage chair when you're not going to be doing massages and you don't want to go out and buy six pedicure chairs when you're not going to offer pedicures for another five years. Don't buy things because you see them uh, as a good deal. And let's say, let's just say I'm starting out cutting hair. What is the bare minimum amount of equipment that I need? Because you're going to get some people trying to go and use up all the money up on their credit card, all the money on the loans. We just need to get started. What is the bare Well, the good thing about this field is when you're in hair school, you uh, the best thing to do is, is to start from scratch. When you're in hair school, Pay attention and write down what, what it is that you need every day in order to be successful at what you're doing in that hair school. You can take that to the salon with you. That's the beauty, of, again, of going to school, having your apprenticeship and things like that, because those things you can you get to see off top. And it's gonna vary depending on what your specialty is. You know, if I'm not, if I don't specialize in thinning hair and making hair thin, and that's not something I'm gonna, a service I'm not gonna offer, then I don't, I don't need to go out and buy thinning shears. Um, if not, I'm, I'm not going to focus on chemical services, then I don't need to go out and buy a bunch of products that only people who do chemical service, services really need. So, people who are in this field, people who go to school for barbering, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Or being a cosmetologist, know exactly what I'm talking about when I say, if you don't use a product, don't buy it. So, coming out of class, you will get everything you need to start your business? You won't get everything you need to start a business. You'll get everything, you'll, you'll have an idea of what everything it is you need to operate your particular business to deliver the service that you have. Like business is just a word, okay? The most important part of a business is the service that you offer, not necessarily the fact that you own a business. You can own a business and offer a, a horrible service and then be, be debunked in a couple of months. But the service is what you want to focus on the most. What service am I going to provide? And that service will tell you exactly what you need for your business. And starting out just cutting hair, where would I go to purchase all the... You everything? just find your local barber supply store and try to find a store that specializes in just your stuff opposed to finding, um, you know, going to your uh, community beauty supply stores and things like that. You want to find something that maybe a national chain that specializes in these things. That way you can get warranties. You know, I, I, I love small businesses, but at the same time, you have to ensure yourself that you secure yourself and your finances because you're making an investment. And when you're making an investment, you have to be a little bit more discreet than you are when you're just walking around. You're like, oh, I'll buy this because it's cute, or I'll buy this because it's nice. You have to really look into, okay, how much, how long of a warranty does this have? And can I buy an extended warranty on it if, I, if necessary? And go from there. Okay, so you suggest purchasing brand new for the warranty and not used? No. Price is everything. Price is everything. But you have to shop according to your budget. Everything used is not bad. But you have to remember that your business has to function. Like buying a used chair. 
Fire to use chair is not a bad idea. But going out buying a used blow dryer is. It's an electrical piece of equipment that can break down. So you buy it used and then it breaks in a week and you got to go back and buy a new one. So for special certain equipment you want to buy new. Anything electrical buy, try to get it as new as possible. So all electrics, brand new, everything else pretty much you can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can be creative with the things that are non-electric. Okay. So where would I go to purchase the waiting chair? The waiting or, chair? Yes. Is that oh my necessary? God. You can go, today, in today's market, you can go anywhere. You can go to Offer Up. You can go to flea markets. You can go anywhere to, to purchase your equipment. The good thing about opening a business, you can be as creative as you want to be in opening your business. You don't, Your furniture doesn't have to be brand new. Be creative. You don't have to go out of your way and spend a whole lot of money doing the decorating. The decorating can be an extremely cheap thing. You know, these, these escape rooms that you go in, some of these people set these escape rooms up by buying stuff at the thrift store buying stuff at the flea market. So when it comes down to that, you can pretty much go, go use your um, your local advertisers, Craigslist, um, OfferUp is, is, is a huge one. And I don't know too many, those are the ones that I basically use when I'm looking for stuff, Craigslist and OfferUp. But there, there are thousands of uh, trading and sales engines out there that you can use, apps you can download to your phone and kind of put in your searches and your queries and come up with uh, get notifications of when these particular items that you have uh, listed are being posted online for sale. And do you suggest, okay, you have the barbershop, you have all the equipment that you need to start out. Do you suggest hiring other barbers as soon as you start out or doing it solo for a while to get the hang of it? Well, you have to implement your own strategy before you can go out and start bringing other people in. So the best thing to do is implement your own strategy and go in and uh, go in and get a feel for what direction you want your business to go in. When you bring your barbers in, bring your stylists in, have a, have information to be able to present to them and say, this is how I want things to go. This is what I'm expecting of you as a barber, and this is what I'm expecting of you as a hairstylist. And those ground rules, housekeeping rules, housekeeping is the term that's highly used across most industries today, and set your housekeeping rules up prior to people coming in. So you want to get your door, get yourself situated, get your housekeeping rules in place, and then get, you know, start hiring. And if you've done all those things, you have your house rules, and you've been in a barbershop, you worked in a salon, you kind of know what you want your ground rules to be, then you can go ahead and start set that up, and you can start hiring prior to. But if you haven't worked in a shop and don't have that experience, it is hard to learn a business while working in it with others and having to be the boss of others at the same time. So go ahead and get in, set your tone for your environment, and then once your tone for your environment is set, then you can move forward from there. And it's easier for people to come in and to blend in uh, with an environment that already exists than it is for them to come in and blend into an environment that you are trying to commit, you're trying to create and have yet to experience. Okay, and say you do all that research and you feel your path is going out and hiring someone. How do you suggest someone go out and hire? Do you do fresh out of school or the more experienced bars? It depends on what, what service, you, what, what type of salon that you're open. If you're offering the latest cuts with the top, with top notch service and this, that, and the other, then you might want to go with people that have more experience. If you're trying to build and grow a certain reputation, then you want to go with people that are fresh because it's hard to teach an old barber new tricks unless that barber that's older and more experienced has the knowledge and that you need in order to build what you want. Then you, you should go with younger people. And now when I say young, I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about the length of time in the industry. You should go with younger people because younger people are more likely to be able to uh, uh, implement a new system of doing things or a new way of doing things and getting it done. The old saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is not necessarily true in its entirety, but it is more difficult to retrain than it is to train from scratch. And do you implement a dress code or is that pretty much a uh, like you said earlier, how you feel. Well, that's an, every business that should implement a dress code. The dress code is always, you know, based on service. You go to Hooters, you know, their dress codes are a lot more relaxed than corporate America because of the service that they offer. So when you offer a service, your service and your dress code should kind of correlate. And what goes into 
coming up with the set amount of charging the boot on it? Like, what all goes into that process? Location, your expenses. You sit down and figure out your expenses and figure out what is the best uh, amount for me to charge to be able to cover my expenses as well as make my profit at the same time. Okay, now I have the barbershop all set up. I hire other employees to work in the barbershop. I have all the equipment. How do you go about going out and getting the customers? What's the best way to bring in customers? <laughs> the age-old best way to bring in customers is always word of mouth. If you provide a good service, if you build it, they will come. Bottom line, word of mouth is the best way to build customers. Nowadays, you can use Facebook, Instagram, and other social media sites in order to get your work out there, promote yourself. But the majority of the things are going to come from the, your, your um, word of mouth. So even with Facebook, Instagram, and all those other things, those are word of mouth advertisement um, outlets. People on there are going to tell people, ask questions, okay, has anybody been to this place before? And then people are going to comment. They're going to look at the services you provide. So once again, word of mouth is the best form of advertisement. Okay. Provide then, good service, do good work, create a great atmosphere, and people will send people your way. Every barbershop, every salon is not made for everybody. So the people that will come to you will be the people that are comfortable in your environment. Just because they're in your environment doesn't necessarily mean they're comfortable in your environment. And how important is it to set aside a budget for marketing? Is that important or should you not worry about that starting out? A bar marketing budget is always a good tool. It's always a good plan to have a marketing budget coming out of the door and keeping your mar mar marketing budget reasonable. You wanna, don't want to go throwing a whole bunch of money into marketing and you don't get anything out of it. Like when I first started out, I was like, oh yeah, I can do a radio commercial and I can do this and I can do that. And then I paid like $800 for the radio station to come out and sit in front of the barbershop and two people came. Mm. Yeah, see, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So just because you're on the radio doesn't mean necessarily that people are going to come. Because more of the people that listen to the station, they support the radio host. So unless you have a radio host that can say, hey, I'm a radio host, and just because people say his name, people are going to show up if he has that reputation. So just as well as they do their research about your location when they come out to it, you need to do your research. Okay, who's, who are you going to send out? And if it's a no-name representative just coming out to use the station's name, then you don't want that guy out there because who's going to come and, and, and support your business because he's there? Nobody. But if you got a top name radio host that's gonna come be there and people follow this guy everywhere he go and, and plug the doors. Thank you, sir. All right, sir. All right, sir. So and people flood the doors because he's there, then you, you know, you definitely wanna bring that guy. Or if you do any type of advertising. Have a good day, Stephanie. You guys take care. See you in two weeks. All right. So if you have a person that's accustomed to um, having a lot of people come out because of their presence, then of course that person you wanna invite them out and get people in the door. But if you can't afford stuff like that, then focus on your immediate surrounding, your family members, your friends, and build as much immediate support as you can and just go at it. Okay, and I, there's a lot of different unique ways of marketing. Come on in, Ms. Fresh. There's a lot of different unique ways of marketing. I see you have a big truck outside with all of your information on it. Mm -hmm. I will show them as well. What made you come up with that idea, and is that a very successful way to start marketing? Well, basically, what it boils down to is I wanted to do a um, billboard. I was like, I want a billboard on the interstate. And when I wanted that billboard on the interstate, and I went out and started looking at the prices, the monthly prices for those billboards, I was like, yeah. And then I saw this truck just sitting in an empty field, and I inquired about it. So when they told me how much the truck cost, I looked at it like, okay, and then I called someone and said, okay, I have a truck this size. What would it cost for me to put, you know, information on the side? So the guy came out, looked at it, gave me an idea of what it would cost. So when I factored it out, it could sit there for 10 years, and that was a one-time fee. But when it came down to the billboard, I have to pay that every month. So that truck's been sitting there now for nine years, and as a result of that truck sitting there nine years, it only cost me what was equivalent to three months of rent. So what would have normally cost me um, thousands of dollars yeah. has only cost me a couple of thousand dollars. Okay. And do you have to pay anything extra for keeping it at that spot? No, on my property, yes. no. Yes. 
Okay. So that's you know, all part of me being all, all part of me leasing my space. So, do you suggest going in? Have well, that's well. Draw back to what you said. What are your dreams and goals, and what you want out of it? Uh huh. So what were you saying? How important is it to own your shop after so many years? Is it to own your shop? Yes. It's all about your goals. It's all about responsibilities. You know, I, I try to follow the model that most large corporations follow, and most large corporations don't own. Okay. A lot of them just lease. And that's because they get the flexibility of leaving at will. So you know you have a year on a lease. Um, for instance, if someone's in the military, then you don't want to go in and have necessarily have to buy a building, and you want to open up a business. So you go in and you lease. Because at any given time, you can be called, and it's easier to break a lease than it is to break a mortgage. So it all depends on what your long-term goals are. Those are the factors that really play a role in um, whether you lease or whether you rent. Okay. And this is another... I mean, whether you lease or whether you buy. Okay. And this is another great marketing. I don't think a lot of people think too much of this. How important is it to greet your customers and tell them, have a nice day? How important is that? Always, always. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm known for slogans. So my slogans normally last for, for years before I switch them up. You know, and, you know some, I say something inspiration to everybody that walks out of that door, whether they're a customer or not. And everybody that comes to your door is not going to be a customer. Some people are just going to be visitors. Some people are just going to be accompanying customers. So when that's, when that's the case, then you just take that um, opportunity to uh, encourage them or say something delightful to them. So when they, when they do remember you or do think about you, they'll remember you a great personality. And how many people may not think about this. How important is keeping your shop and restroom clean? Oh, it's important. Sanitation, sterilization. I mean, those are things that are required by law. So if it's required by law, then that tells you that there's a level of importance. Sanitation and sterilization are some things that um, when you go through hair school, you learn anyways. You know, you learn to clean your equipment you know, behind the clients, this, that, and the other. And as a result of you learning to clean that equipment, the value of it is that you get to protect the general public. The whole point, the purpose of the Department of Professional Business Regulation is to regulate business for the purpose of public safety. So just always remember that as a business owner, you're responsible for your clients, and as long as you remember that, then you should be good to go. Follow the procedures of your state, local uh, government, and you should be just fine. So what goes into coming up with the shop hours? Shop hours? Yes. Your availability. Your availability is what goes into formulating your shop hours. I'm just joking. It's not your availability. What, what goes into creating your shop hours is the clientele that you want to cater to. If you want to cater to a clientele of people that go that are nightclub um, and party goers, then you probably are not going to open up at 6 in the morning because they're asleep. So you want to open up according to who, what is your clientele. Having a target market is very important when doing, uh, when opening up any type of business. Your target market will tell you when you should open and when you should close. And that same information, would that tell you what you do appointments or walk-ins? Or is that something you need to come up with prior to? Appointments or walk-ins, another. That's, that's what they, you do, what they call a market analysis. And a market analysis on the people that you're catering to. If the people that you're cater, catering to are sporadic, then you want to do walk-ins. If the people that you're catering to operate best on a the schedule, then you want to do appointments. I do appointments. It's worked out better for me than anything I've ever done. My clients are here. Miss Precious is here every Saturday. I see her every Saturday morning, 7 o'clock, when we draw, and we get it done. And a lot of people may not think about this when going in to open a shop. What do you do on your downtimes when things are slow? How do you pick things up? How do you do what now? Pick things up to get more customers when you're not really getting any customers when you hit that. Well, I mean, point. that's where your legwork comes in. You can go out and pass out flyers. You can go out and talk to people. You can go out and do mix and mingles, luncheons, uh, find out what's going on, what's new and happening in your city, going to those places, passing out cars. You know, you stand up, you want to stay amongst people that are going to be able to spend the money that, uh, be able to have, be able to afford the services that you offer. Now that you have the customers based on the information that you provided to get them in, 
Now the income comes in. How do you come up with the pricing so you can service the customers? Providing your customers with the pricing? Yes. Our pricing is based on your, your um, the, the clientele that you're catering to. And then you want to do competitive pricing across the market. You don't want to undersell yourself because you'll be doing twice the work as someone else do for half the price. So you want to always base your um, pricing on the market that you're in. And does that also come in your location, how much you're paying to keep the business up? What do you mean? Like, say you in Elaborate. The, like, say for instance, Tampa. If you're mm -hmm. in South Tampa, you're going to pay more for rent. Based yeah, on. Your, rent, your rent before you even go in the door should be based on your budget, that you, your projected budget. And your projected budget should be formulated around your price and all of that should go in a, a lot. There are a lot of factors that goes into actually setting up and actually um, figuring out exactly what your prices are going to be overall. When you set out your, when you put your business plan together, all of those things should be in your business plan. When you talk to your accountant about your business plan, all of those numbers will be in there. The accountant will be able to show you um, based on what you're saying and based on what you project here, how realistic your game plan and your strategy is. And that in, that's including your rent and all of those things. You don't, if you don't, if you're not good at budgeting, if you don't know the, the numbers, then you get a CPA or get us get someone that's in, that knows finance to be able to sit down and put those numbers together for you. It's not this, that's not like a simple thing that I can just go and say, okay, do this, do this, do this, and that'll work. Yes. You really need to seek professional advice in order to get those things done. People don't like to play. And I'm going to say this and say this nice and clear. Most African Americans and minorities don't like seeking consultants. But sometimes you need to go and you need to talk to a consultant that specializes in the area in order for you to be accessible. Your cousin may have done it, your auntie may have done it, but that may not be your story because your 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 final destination may be 10 times greater than theirs. And when it comes to payment, should you start out doing all cash transactions or implement the credit and debit? I always say go whatever your clients, your clientele, base your 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 your, your um the way you charge on your clientele. You know, I do both. I do both cash and charge for my clients because my clients are uh, a mixture. My clientele is mixed. So I have some people that prefer cash. I have some that prefer credit card. So, you know, right now with credit card rates being so low, I mean, it's, you're really not missing much. There uh, Again, that's something you talk to your accountant about because your accountant can tell you how to uh, make sure that those fees are offset. They'll come up, they have creative ways of helping you to offset those fees. Okay, now you're making money. I'm not saying that you're starting to get a profit, but how do you keep up with the books? How do you document all of this information that's coming in? So that well, there are apps nowadays that can help you, that pretty much offer you um, all the services that you can possibly think of from uh, creating charts of the amount of customers and the amount of money you bring in. So you can basically just uh, purchase one of the apps, the Square app. Square Cash app is a real good app. You know, you can keep tally of your cash, you can keep tally of your credit cards, print out reports, take a look back at your month. They give you reports where you can go in and look at what you've done over the month and see what your slow days were, your fast days. All that stuff nowadays is pretty much um, done for you by a lot of the apps that already exist. And, and I said Square Cash app. I meant the Square, the Square.com, because Square Cash is something different. But the Square processing for, for um, businesses that's what you should use, one of the apps that, um, that's the app that I use, and that's one of the apps that I advise people to go to that can give them for free um, a lot of the basic services that you need to be able to um, analyze your annual, weekly, um, and daily projections. Okay. Now, at what point should you start paying yourself? Paying yourself? Yes. Paying yourself all depends on your corporate structure. And, like again, that's another question that you defer to your um, to your accountant. Your accountant will tell you what's the best way to pay yourself based on what your goals are. Because your goals, if your goal is to um, to just build the money capital within your business, then you're not going to pay yourself much of anything. But if you have a mortgage and car payments and all these other things, then that means that you're going to need the more pay and your business is going to get less money going into the business. 
all, and that's all based on how much business you're doing. So again, those are things that you want to make sure that you stick with your CPA uh, on because those numbers vary according to the situation. Okay. And what goes into finding a good CPA? I heard you talk about it multiple times and how important that is. How do you find a good one? CPA, word of mouth. Word of mouth and the number of clients that they have that are in your field. A CPA that specializes in used car lots may not know a lot about hair. So he may not know all of the things that you that would benefit you in your field when it comes down to you filing your taxes and coming down to you claiming the, the, the amount of things that you can claim on your taxes as write-offs. So you want to go with someone who specializes and have, has a pretty large clientele and a good awareness of your career field. And they will help you file all your taxes and let you know when you should pay and how much you should pay as well? Yes. I just want to make sure that they get that information and stress how important it is to pay your taxes. Should, they should not try to do this on their own. What opening a business? Well, no, you can't. You 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 shouldn't try to do it. All if you want to be successful, then stick to the rule book. The rule book is what helps keep you successful. When you don't stick to the rule book, you have a tendency to put yourself in some positions that is going to be hard to get you out of later on. So stick to the rule book. Stick to the rule books. Stick to the professionals, the ones who know. The industry, the one who's already who been around long enough to understand the things that you don't know. There's a lot to know in business. It's not, it's easy to work in a business, easy to run a business, but the hard part is managing the business, managing to make that business stay around for an extended period of time. And what point should you start selling products, or should that be the furthest thing from your mind when starting out? Products are always based on service. If you've done your research, then you can start your products from day one. Your basic products that your particular service um, offers or that it requires, the, the, the basic uh, products that your particular service require, those things you can do from day one. And then things that as time progresses, your inventory will grow based on the service that you're trying to provide. And do you think it's important to provide snacks for sale? That is important. Yes. It's not a bad idea. I don't think it's quintessentially important. I mean, you know, you have people that are not as sanitary as others, and you know, you don't. You have to clean up behind them. And if you're extremely busy, you don't have time to do that. Then those people can leave a mess all over your floor and leave food everywhere, uh, creating insects and things like that. But for the most part, um, it's 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 okay to offer snacks, but it's not like a big deal too. And do you have any tips for anyone getting started in this business? Do your homework. The best tip that I can give you is do your homework. Go into, um, take everything you learned in hair school. Go into a business um, that's already existing and has the clientele that you're looking for. Go into that business. Pay attention to the environment. Do your analytical research. Do your um your hands-on research, where you're actually interacting with the customers, interacting with other barbers, um, the whole environment, the uh, bill pay structure, getting used to having that commitment to paying that, that bill every week. And as a result of that, you'll be able to have a great foundation to move forward on. And if you're in a place, and then you have an opportunity to say, okay, well, I thought this was what I wanted in this particular environment, but this particular environment is not really what I want professionally. So I wanna you know, go and move to another shop. And you can do that. Just try not to do that too much. Try not to move around too much because of the fact that once you get all that pollution in you, all those bad environments in you, it's kind of hard to get that stuff out of you. So try to be very discreet with what you pick. Pick something close to what you want and then go into that environment and allow yourself to embrace and um, soak up all the knowledge and information in there. So what obstacles have you faced and how do you prepare for the unexpected? The best way to prepare for the unexpected is you can't be prepared for the unexpected. You just have to be versatile. You have to be willing to change directions at the drop of a dime. You can't be so stuck in your method and mode of doing things until you fail to real look at the realities. And what I mean by fail to look at the realities, I mean you may lose customers because of the way you run your business. But if losing those customers uh, are going to, it's going to 
um, hurt your business, then you definitely want to make your adjustments. Your adjustments that you make may not be based on what your, your initial um, projections, but if they're going to keep your doors open and they're going to help your business grow and they don't cause you to compromise who you are and what it is that you're trying to establish in your business, then go ahead and do so. Over the years, people are like, Des, you, you, you've lost customers. And I always tell them that if I lose a customer, then that customer probably wasn't a customer for me, and that's fine. There are a lot of hairstyles, a lot of barbers out here, and everybody doesn't fit everywhere. So the thing about it is not to um, focus on the loss of customers the, or, do, or making a bad decision. The bounce back is the most important thing, being able to bounce back. And that's one thing I specialize in, and that is bouncing back. If I make a, a mishap or if I have an erroneous decision that I've made, then I bounce back from them extremely quickly because of the fact I don't hold on to them. I immediately go into, decision, uh, in, into solution <coughs> mode. And solution mode is the best mindset that you can be in. And when something happens, don't think about what happens. Think about the best way to fix it. If you don't know, ask Miss Precious and she will give you the right answer. <laughs> Everybody needs a Miss Precious. Everybody needs someone that they can talk to and ask questions about. And that's one of the biggest things that you should always have in business. You should always have someone outside of the pocket, outside of your industry, that you can talk with about the decisions that's being made in your business. And not, not only so they can advise you, but more so so that that person can, can give you a, a viewpoint that's outside of your viewpoint. So not from necessarily an advisory uh, position, but just from a general, um, from, a, from a friend standpoint, from a I'm not you standpoint. That's, that's vital to long-term success. That's vital to making erroneous decisions. It's, uh, it's a great thing to have. So, All right. Thank you very much. I'll wait to finish up so you can have a book. Anything that you have, you want to shout out, you want to promote, you want to put out there for <laughs> these guys to go support. Let's see. Support Black Kettle Around the World. Black Kettle Around the World is a corporation that I started as a result of being everything you just discussed that I, we just discussed in this video was a summary of why I started Black Kettle Around the World. Um, a lot of people there are a lot. There's a lot of information out there that's not known. There are a lot of people out there who feel alone. There are a lot of people, um, especially African Americans and Black people around the globe, considering the experience of our ancestors and things of that nature. So I started Black Kettle Around the World to be able to create a conglomerate, to be able to create a global family. Um, somehow we got restricted into the arena that a family meant father, wife, daughter, son, and that, and, and, and things of that sort. But family is bigger than that. Family is global. You can go anywhere in the world and find people that will take you in, find people that will treat you like, uh, like, like you're a member of their family, like your blood, and they will look out for you, take care of you. Black Kettle Around the World seeks to do that on a global scale. Um, one of our main purposes is to focus on our youth. The other purpose is to focus on our economics, the social aspect of our communities, and long-term sustainability. Those four factors are the factors that Black Kettle Around, around the World is built on and it intends to continue to stand on. We will build great things, we will build corporate complexes, we will build major youth centers, and those corporate complexes and youth centers will work together hand in hand for long-term sustainability in African American communities and the communities of black people around the world. So in a few weeks, you'll be able to download a Black Kettle Around the World app, you'll be able to log in, sign up, become a member and be able to read about things that are going on in the United States, things that are going on in Africa, things that are going on in Holland, things are going on in countries all around the world where black people are. We don't have enough global knowledge about each other. We don't know the true history of the black experience around the globe. And we want to be able to put that true history in museums and not just let a few people who have read a few books or a few people who have done a little travel define what blackness is and who we are around the globe. We are in countries all over the world, thousands of countries, thousands of cities, thousands of states. And in each one of those cities, each one of those states, blacks have a different experience. So we need to stop bubbling ourselves, stop putting ourselves in a box and allow ourselves to adjust to the enormity of our cultures, the enormity of our experience and the enormity of the future that is waiting on us to embrace it 
and make our children everything that we want them to be and also take those adults who've been beaten by life experience and mishaps and put them in a position of empowerment, growth, and determination. Okay, and where would they go follow you so they can get that update to say, okay, you can start supporting Black Kettle here? You can go to um, your Square Cash app. We do that for people that want to contribute to Black Kettle around the world. Square Cash app is dot dollar sign, B-L-A-C-K-K-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, one word. You'll see the name Desmond Key pop up. That's me. And you can go there to make any contributions to Black Kettle Around the World. You can go to Instagram, put in Black Kettle Around the World, and you can join our Instagram page. You can also go to www.bkatw.com and go to the Black Kettle Around the World website and get updated on what it is that we're focusing on. We'll start uploading things um, in the upcoming week and you'll be able to see what our focal points are, what our focal points are at that moment and you'll be able to keep track of where we're going as a company, where we're going as a people and where we end to go as a nation around the globe. You can always come and support the barbershop. Uh, we have our Black Kettle Around the World t-shirts for sale. Can you pass me one of those t-shirts over there? We have these t-shirts for sale. These t-shirts are 20 bucks. These are our fundraising. These are our fundraising t-shirts, Black Kettle Around the World t-shirts. These t-shirts are 20 bucks. We've also established a relationship um, with uh, seamstress in the Ghana continent of Africa, and we have clothes that are actually made in Ghana. If you spin the camera around, you'll see those continent, you'll see those clothes over there. Those clothes were actually made in Ghana by a young lady named Nadu, and Nadu and I we talk a lot on uh, uh, we we talk a lot on the phone. We do a lot of FaceTime so that I can see actually what she's doing in the shop. I can say, oh, I like that. Oh, I don't and she makes adjustments accordingly. And then I also have a seamstress here in the United States that makes any adjustments to whatever clothing you come in and buy. Our outfits start at 125 per outfit. Everything's hand designed, hand sewn, hand made. So it's all authentic African made African gear. Now do benefits off of it. Black Kettle around the world benefits off of it. And as we grow, our community will be, be able to benefit from all sales and all proceeds that are coming from Black Kettle around the world. We are not a nonprofit. We are a poor profit profit company. I'm not a beggar. I don't ask people for things. I am a businessman. I go out and I create opportunity for myself. And in the process of creating opportunity for myself, I create opportunity for others. That is my goal. That is my desire. I'm located at 3835 North 50th Street, Tampa, Florida, DMB Barbershop. You can call me at 813-376-6637 or text the exact same number with any questions, any, any um, desires or wishes to schedule appointments. I am an appointment-based business, 24 hours, seven days a week, Thursday through Sunday. All right, guys, and if you enjoy all this great information that you received today, Go ahead. Go ahead and support Mr. Desmond and all of his visions. Go ahead and like his page. Follow his page on Instagram and support the movement that he's implementing and trying to help change the world for the better. And I'm also I thought about this while we were doing the interview. I'm going to pay for some one guys or girls. How should we do it? Girl or boy? Well, I mean, you just pay for a haircut, then it doesn't matter so, what the sex whoever. is, whoever comes in to get a haircut. Okay, so I'm going to pay for a haircut, and whoever calls this number on the screen and set the appointment and say that you come from the Dominica Fet, you get a free haircut. Just call in, set up the appointment, and come in and get a free haircut. Anything you else you want to add? I see you. That, 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 that's about it. Okay. I mean, we've we both basically covered everything that I can possibly cover when it comes down to uh, opening up a barbershop, uh, running a business, and that advice doesn't just go with opening up a barbershop. That that advice goes across the board when opening yeah. up any kind of business. And um, when it comes down to black kettle around the world, the overall goal is to enrich our communities all over the planet. I mean, we've gotten into a position where people are looking at us as though we need help and that we need people to come and, and save us in our community. And a lot of our community leaders are walking around actually asking the federal government to come in and save our communities when that's our job. Black Kettle Around the World 
looks for self-sustainability, focuses on self-sustainability, focuses on us be taking what we have and utilizing what we have to be able to build and to grow our communities without necessarily reaching out to the exterior for help in order to do that. Okay. Thank you very much again. I appreciate all this information You're and knowledge that you provided to this channel. And please go support Black Follow Kevin. Dominique. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Get addicted to the Dominique effect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there you have it. All right. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome, sir. I really appreciate it.